Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Vasanta Devasiri and the Council of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, all the postgraduate doctors and other these consultants that who have gathered here to the SLMA auditorium and all others that who have got connected online. Uh, for the, this is the actually third, the monthly clinical meeting organized by the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. The, at this today's clinical meeting, we would be discussing a topic that I would see as rare, but then the it says that no longer, longer a disease of waste. So probably that we must be seeing it more prevalent than when I was a trainee. So this, we would be discussing over next one and a half hours on cystic fibrosis. So at the outset, let me invite Dr. Chana De Silva, consultant pediatric pulmonologist uh, from the LRH to co-chair this with, session with me to the podium. Uh, and uh, let me warmly welcome all of you for this monthly clinical meeting. Uh, for us to commence the proceedings of the clinical meeting, our first speaker would be Dr. Srimali Vijay Sundara, a case presentation. I mean, she'll be doing a case presentation and she's the senior registrar in pediatric pulmonology, LRH. Dr. Srimali Vijay Sundara. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, so, uh, we are going to discuss uh, about a uh, few case scenarios uh, on cystic fibrosis. Uh, so I would lay the platform by starting. Uh, first case scenario, uh, it's a 10 month old baby girl who was transferred from Putlam to LRH, uh, who was the fifth uh, child of the non-consanguineous healthy parents, born as the second uh, dichorionic diamniotic twin following an emergency cesarean section with a birth weight of 2.48 kilograms. There were no uh, significant postnatal complications and uh, both the twins were discharged on third day following delivery. Since uh, four months of age, uh, this uh, baby needed three hospital admissions. Uh, at four months, uh, she, she was managed as bronchiolitis with second bacterial infection however, needed inward care for 14 days, uh, which is not quite usual for a mild bronchiolitis. However, uh, at that point was detected to have failure to thrive in this child. And uh, following that, at six months of age, there was another episode of uh, lower respiratory tract infection, with, which was associated with uh, wheezing and uh, needed high dependency care unit uh, uh, treatment at the ward. And uh, following that, at seven months of age, this child readmitted with a lower respiratory tract infection, which is also associated with uh, wheezing, which also needed a one week hospital stay. However, there were no associated bowel motion abnormalities and her cardiac evaluation was normal. So uh, uh, this was her growth chart. And uh, there you can see uh, uh, growth folder in there and uh, so weight for length was less than minus 3 SD with the uh, preserved head circumference. So at this point the differential diagnosis we entertained were the immunodeficiency which is uh, could be primary or acquired and also recurrent aspirations uh, could be due to gastroesophageal reflux disease or incoordinated swallowing problems, and also structural abnormalities like uh, H type tracheoesophageal fistula uh, or sequestrations, uh, such as those things. And also, pulmonary tuberculosis in our setup is also high on the list. 
uh, then again, cystic fibrosis we must consider and uh, rarely interstitial lung diseases could also cause this. So evaluation wise, uh, we, uh, plan to do, we planned immunological studies to exclude the uh, immunodeficiency, primary immunodeficiency. So flow cytometry, uh, NBT test, immunoglobulin levels, and HIV screening for acquired immune deficiency. And also for TB, pulmonary TB exclusion, we uh, did the gastric aspirate for AFP, TB cultures and gene experts. And also so following assessment, milk scan with uh, upper GI contrast studies were also planned and initial chest imaging with chest x-rays. So uh, immunological studies were negative, HIV screening negative and uh, pulmonary TB was excluded and uh, chest imaging wise, there were no obvious structural abnormalities were seen, just perihilar shadowing and mild hyperinflation. So how, do, how, how can we proceed? So following that, uh, with respiratory distress and all, uh, we acquired a blood gas analysis. There you could see pH of 7.6 with a high bicarb level of uh, 51.4 and with a base excess of 29. So this is metabolic alkalosis in the blood gas analysis. So then we proceed to do the serum electrolytes, which was shown quite low levels of sodium, potassium and chloride. Apart from that, calcium was also in the lower range. So those are low. What could be the cause? It could be basically, first thing we would consider is the renal. So uh, we proceeded with urinary electrolytes. So those were, within normal limits though. So uh, this leads to the diagnosis of pseudobarter syndrome. So uh, with the pattern recognition, the recurrent respiratory tract infections, common DD is already excluded and with associated failure to thrive and pseudobarter syndrome. So the likely to be cystic fibrosis. They are proceeded to diagnosis of cystic fibrosis with sweat test, which is available in LRH, uh, which showed positive results with sweat chloride of 84 millimoles per liter, where the cutoff is around 60. So genetic tests were sent and it was also found to be positive. And at that point, we proceeded with HRCT scan of the chest which uh, didn't show the definitive features of cystic fib fibrosis associated bronchiectasis at that point, and only peribronchial thickening uh, in perihilar bronchi was seen, and the patchy consolidations in both lower lobes only. So management-wise, uh, these uh, acute exacerbations were adequately treated, and the airway clearance techniques were commenced with uh, chest physiotherapy, and uh, following a 3% normal cell nebulization, uh, continued the inhaler therapies as there was a response and acetromycin prophylaxis was started with the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy and nutritional rehabilitation. So let's move on to the second case, which is a bit of similar to the first one. So this is also an eight month old baby girl from Mathara. And uh, this one, a uh, third born baby of third degree consanguineous marriage with uh, elder brother and uh, both other siblings, both were elder, were quite healthy. And uh, this child was delivered vaginally at term with a birth weight of three kilos. And her antenatal and postnatal periods were also uncomplicated. Uh, however, in this child also, the presentation was with recurrent chest infections associated with wheezing. And this was since early infancy. So at uh, two months, the first admission, which was managed as mild bronchiolitis with wheezing, but however, this child needed six days of inward stay. And second admission also managed as bronchiolitis within the same uh, month uh, and followed by a secondary bacterial infection. So uh, because of this persistence of symptoms, this child and the severity of wheezing, this child was started on uh, inhaled steroids and also reliever medications. Uh, following month also needed the third admission with low respiratory tract infection and wheezing. And this time child required ICU care and with mechanical ventilation and supportive care was given. 
So at that point, tracheal culture aspirated Tracheal aspirate culture was positive for Pseudomonas species. So in this child, it was noted to have failure thrive with steatoria. And there are features of protein energy malnutrition. As you, you all could see, there's a, not very clear. There's flag sign in the hair. And uh, her growth parameters uh, showed the uh, weight to length of less than 3 SD and edema. Flaky pain dermatitis, which I don't have a photo of, was also there at that time. And uh, a stool full report showed fat, fat, uh, stool fat globules. Then uh, her VBG also showed a pH of 7.6 with high bicarbonate with a high base excess, and uh, followed by low serum electrolytes and associated normal urinary electrolytes. So this one, metabolic alkalosis, low serum electrolytes, and normal urinary ele electrolytes leads to diagnosis of pseudobutter syndrome. When we consider all those features together, so recurrent respiratory tract infections, failure to thrive with protein and malnutrition, steatoria, pseudobutter syndrome, and uh, this in the background, this child is a product of consanguineous marriage. So cystic fibrosis was more likely. So the diagnosis was made with sweat chloride test, which was positive with the sweat chloride of 103 millimoles per liter and genetic testing also, though it was negative for the uh, very common uh, uh, Delta 508 mutation with uh, extended mutation analysis, it was found to be positive for a quite common mutation. Uh, so in this child also, uh, child was uh, treated for eradication uh, of uh, pseudomonascular colonization initially and AIV clearance techniques were commenced and uh, inhaler therapies also continued as acetamycin prophylaxis as before, pancreatic, uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy and nutritional rehabilitation and the follow-up. So we'll proceed to the case three, which is a bit of different to the previous two cases. This was a nine-year-old boy from Moratua also, also a third born child from a second degree consanguineous marriage. Uh, and there was a family history of sibling death at four months of age with features of liver failure, possibly due to a metabolic liver disease. Uh, this one was delivered vaginally at term with a birth weight of 2.7 kilograms. And uh, there was no respiratory distress at birth and uh, there were no history given with a myelias. The bowel motions were normal. This one also detected to have failure to thrive since early infancy and uh, associated with episodic vomiting and hepatomegaly without splenomegaly. There were elevated transaminases, elevated gamma GT, low albumin levels, and slightly elevated indirect bilirubin. So he was extensively investigated due to features of chronic hepatitis and failure to thrive since early infancy with the background family history. So at that point, the differential diagnosis were congenital infections and also metabolic hepatopathy. So evaluation-wise, the TOS screening, which was negative, also known abdomens, repeated ones were done. Initially, it was suggestive of liver parenchymal disease. And uh, with that also suggested liver biopsy, given the family history of previous child also querying uh, tyrosinemia. So uh, this child, uh, however, undergone uh, two liver biopsies, which uh, first one revealed uh, chronic hepatitis with uh, macrovascular steatosis and early portal fibrosis. And uh, second one also features of metabolic hepatopathy, moderate macrovascular steatosis, twin bands of fibrous tissue noted ex extended from portal tracts. So metabolic screening was done, it was negative and amino acid profile was negative. Uh, later on, the ultrasound abdomen showed uh, mild hepatomegaly with uh, fatty changes of the liver, grade 1 to 2, and uh, queried metabolic disease. And uh, interestingly, pancreas showed atrophy. And with that, uh, suggestion was to proceed with MRI abdomen. So it showed atrophied pancreas with fat infiltration. However, so with all these investigations, uh, queried, there's a missing link because there, there's uncertainty to the diagnosis. 
however uh, with all that uh, with the uh, expert opinion initially in between pancreatic enzyme replacement also started so during this time he needed repeated uh, admissions due to recurrent respiratory tract infections however these were not associated with severe pneumonia episodes as we would expect so with a high degree of suspicion due to consanguinity sibling death with query liver disease liver involvement with some suggestive biopsy features and pancreatic atrophy recurrent gastric symptoms failure to thrive and recurrent respiratory infections investigated for cystic fibrosis quite rightly so diagnosis was made with sweat chloride test which was positive and also genetic studies those are also positive so at the diagnosis child was having failure to thrive grade 1 to 2 clubbing and minimal lung signs with significant hepatomegaly without splenomegaly chest imaging was done at that time hrct showed no changes of bronchiectasis at that point so management wise optimized the yeah pancreatic enzyme replacement and nutritional rehabilitation and airway clearance techniques were uh, commenced and those prophylaxis was started and genetic counseling plan for this family so uh, with these three uh, cases and yet there there should be there would be more uh, i have presented only three which i have encountered in during my quite short period of training so uh, we can say that it's no more a disease of the best so we must consider it in our differential diagnosis list and uh, apart from that sri lanka needs a proper case registry in cystic fibrosis and assessment of the disease incidence also and uh, there would be uh, further steps to uh, have uh, multidisciplinary care teams at tertiary care hospitals it would be beneficial for all these children thank you Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Madam, for your kind introduction. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Sri Lanka Medical Association for uh, giving this opportunity to the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians to share this. Uh, a monthly clinical meeting in february and then uh, i would like to thank the sri lanka college of pediatricians to give in this opportunity to uh, our team to discuss about the cystic fibrosis uh, dr shreemali uh, laid the foundations and uh, used uh, already so the lot of uh, different presentations of this uh, uh, disease in small children and uh, most obviously it is persisting it is existing in sri lanka so i will give some sort of brief out overview of, about this conditions uh, its epidemiology and the wide clinical spectrum and the basic principles of the management just to touch on the principles of management so uh, first um, i would like to discuss this term so cystic fibrosis of the pancreas what is this uh in early uh 20th century 21st century uh, there was a pathologist in usa called dr dorothy anderson and she did uh, various autopsies in children and uh, while she is doing this uh, autopsies in children who are died of malnutrition and clinically diagnosed as celiac disease she has noticed that uh, there were some changes in these children in pancreas there were some cystic lesions in the background of uh, fibrotic changes and she has also noticed these children this apart from the pancreas these changes are also in the lungs as well and so she thought that this is a one of this is not a simply celiac disease there is another possibly some other disease causing the changes in these both organisms and she has published this article in 1938 cystic fibrosis of the pancreas and its relationship to the celiac disease a clinical and pathological study so this is the first scientific description of this disease and she termed this disease as the cystic fibrosis of the pancreas but later there were many many development of the understanding of the disease uh, it has been identified this as a genetic disorder and finally the locus has been identified and then the defect the molecular defect has been identified and the various di uh, diagnostic as well as the management method has been developed and finally there were new developments in the management of or the uh, addressing the uh, the molecular level so 
uh, gradually when the understanding of the disease is not confined to pancreas so then this pancreas terms just left and now we know this is just a, we term this as a cystic fibrosis so what is this so this is a genetic disorder also from a recessive disorder and uh, it is happening because of this mutations in the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductor regulator gene this is uh, located in the uh, long arm of chromosome 7 this is a fairly a large gene and believe me up to now they have identified more than 2000 mutations of this gene but not all these uh, mutations cause cystic fibrosis. About 250 uh, mutations are not associated with disease, but there are a wide spectrum of uh, variations in the uh, structure of this cystic uh, CFTR gene uh, leading to the wide spectrum of clinical manifestations of this disease. So the key uh, uh, the defect is at the CFTR the molecule, the channel. So this is a membrane transporter, which is found in uh, many of the organs. And so the main function of this channel is to regulate the uh, chloride transport across the cell membrane, especially this is at the luminal surface of so the cells in the luminal surface of many duct, uh, in all in uh, uh, various organs, I'll come. And uh, so because of this uh, channel, so this channel mainly regulate the chloride transport and it lies some, it's a little complicated uh, mechanisms and there's uh, some sort of uh, active uh, cyclic AMP mediation also there, but it's it's mainly the, the transport of chloride happened according to the concentration gradient. So this channel uh, this allow the pre flow of chloride through this channel. So, however, most importantly, the simple chloride mechanisms doesn't lead into this much of disease. And obviously, chloride transport is associated with the uh, transport of sodium, and then sodium transport is associated with the uh, transport of water molecule because of this osmosis. So because of that, this is very important as a regulator of uh, uh, the uh, ion transport across cell membrane. And it's also a regulator of some other ion channel like INAC, epithelial sodium channel. So because of this, some authors believe rather than the control in the chlorium tra so chloride transport across the cell membrane, the main function of this channel is a regulation of other channels. That is the possible reasons to develop this much of wide variations in clinical manifestations with various variable degree of severity. So it is persist, uh, this channel we can see in the surface of the most of the uh, cells in the body, but most importantly, the lungs, the sweat gland, intestine, pancreas, sinuses, and the reproductive system. These are the major organs which affect the uh, defect of this a channel even it's uh, presence in the kidneys but there are other lot of channels because of that the defect in the functions of the cftr in kidney does not give rise to any clinical manifestation so uh, so the most importantly it's controlled the iron and water content of luminal secretions that is the major uh, pathological changes which happen in the uh, absence of the functions of uh, improper function of these channels which is leading to most of the clinical manifestations of this disease so this is uh, membrane uh, uh, iron, uh, the iron channel, which is made up of proteins, a complicated protein. So as uh, you all know, so to make this channel, so protein should be synthesized. There are many steps in all in this. DNA should be transcribed to uh, form mRNA, and this mRNA should be translated to polypeptide chain. And this polypeptide chain should be folded uh, according to the, the given structure to main the, uh, may, uh, form the channel and then uh, from the Golga apparatus this channel should uh, come into its uh, normal place which is the uh, the uh, the luminal side of the cell membrane there are defects can happen in any part of this uh, cycle of formation of this channel uh, and the starting of its normal punches because of this uh, there are they have identified six types of defects which cause in this disease so various mutations as i mentioned so over 2000 mutations leading to different kind of uh, channel defects different types and according to the involvement of these types the channel Channels, uh, the clinical spectrum or the severity would be varied. So I'm not going to do details, but simply uh, the type 1 uh, defects, type 1 mutations, no synthesis of mRNA at all. Uh, type 2, this uh, the um, 
polypeptide chain is formed, but it's not folded according to the, uh, the structure and other defects. Uh, the channels are there, but they are not working properly. So because of this, the early, the first three uh, uh, mutations, types of mutations cause the severe disease, so classic CF, but other types, the um, some sort of functioning CFTR is there because of that produce mild disease. So if we consider the epidemic of this disease, so our topic is no longer disease of waste. So CF in West, that is the commonest lethal genetic disorder among Caucasians, especially uh, the Caucasian people live in these European countries and North America. And its very prevalence is very high, about around one in, uh, uh, this incidence, one in 2,500 live births. And because of that, the, the, some of these countries, they do the newborn screening with the Guthricard assessment of immune reactive trypsinogens to identify disease uh, before the development of clinical features. And uh, at the moment, UK, about 10,500 people are living with cystic fibrosis. So the most important thing is the development of the management uh, going into the uh, the advancement of this management, CEF is no longer childhood disease. Now it's becoming an adult disease because more and more patients, more and more children survive up to adulthood. And now 60% uh, of the UK populations of CEF patients are adults. And 2016, the US also, the adult population of CEF more than 18 years uh, increased the more than the pediatric populations because of this increase management strategies and now their life expectancy also increased but still still it's a life limiting disease median life expectancy is 47 years in uk with the best of management options so the the classic the the delta 508 deletions that is the old term now it's called as uh, f508 deletions that is a loss of sim single penylalanine residues at codon 5.8 uh, lead into type 2 mutations. The polypeptide chain is formed, but it doesn't fall according to the, uh, the normal structure to make a proper channel. So this is the commonest genetic variance in this Caucasian people, about 70% or more than that in the uh, population uh, have this uh, 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 genetic defects in uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, although there were 2,000 mutations, only about 50, 50 genes which lead into the uh, 50 genetic mutations leading to the disease in most of the patients over 95% of the time. So CSV Asia, so even though it's very common, the commonest lethal genetic abnormality in uh, patients in the Caucasian, among the Caucasians or in the West, uh, the, even in the migrants of Asian people also have the disease they have diagnosed, but it's little less obviously. The incidence may be one in 10,000 to one in 40,000 live births. And Asian countries also, they have identified the disease presence confirmed uh, surprisingly. Some Middle East countries like Jordan, so almost incidence is almost equal as this Caucasian populations. But some countries like Japan and China, the, the uh, uh, identification of disease is very, very, very low. But still, uh, like India, so they have identified this disease since 1968. However, even though the delta 5 noted mutations is the commonest one in Caucasian people, the Asian populations, including India, even in Sri Lanka, these deletions was uh, uh, not a common one. And it's all the maximum is uh, one third of patients, up about 12% to 34% of patients have this uh, genetic mutation. So if we want to diagnose these things, so and, uh, if absence of uh, Delta 508 does not exclude uh, CEF in our setup. So the problem in Asia is still under diagnosis, under reporting and lack of uh, national registers. And other thing is variable in the frequency of CF, uh, CF mutations. And they have identified wide variations in these uh, uh, mutations. So all these things lead into a uh, reduction or uh, the lack of uh, proper diagnosis. And because of that, the uh, reduce the number. But that doesn't mean this disease is not existing in Asian countries. Coming into Sri Lanka, the first report case was reported in 1994. It was published in the Ceylon Medical Journal, uh, diagnosed by Professor Harendra Silva and with his two registrars and the, uh, the, um, now they are uh, senior consultant pediatricians. So this is a girl uh, came from uh, Goal, uh, had 
recurrent respiratory tract infection, severe failure to thrive, and identified having hyponatremia and pseudomonas colonization, and all these things possibly uh, related to cystic fibrosis. That importantly, uh, she is a sixth child uh, of uh, non -consang consanguineous parents, and two siblings were died due to respiratory infections, and they were initially treated as tuberculosis. This girl also received cause of anti TB drugs as well as this hyponatremia was attributed as um, syndrome of in inappropriate ADH related to uh, tuberculosis in another center. But finally, they suspected this uh, case, uh, possible case of cystic fibrosis, and did because that time this. Um, Set chloride test was not available. They use another method using silver nitrate, use the uh, formation of uh, uh, silver chloride. Uh, that is a semi quantitative assessment that was positive and case was confirmed. Since then, uh, there are many cases reported, but that doesn't mean this is what not existed before. That most probably uh, these children were uh, diagnosed and managed as some other conditions and died uh, early in life. At the moment, uh, possibly there are over 30 uh, cases of cystic fibrosis, maybe around 50, but still we don't have a proper registry. And importantly, the majority of them, more than 50% of these patients are coming from this Muslim community. Maybe um, they have some sort of a common genetic inheritance through coming through this uh, possibly India, but still, there are also uh, nice uh, uh, articles recently published, uh, done at uh, LRH, again, uh, the phenotype spectrum of uh, and genetic heterogeneity of cystic fibrosis, but they have identified it is also not common to this genetic, the mutations are not common to the uh, mutations which find in India. So, so there might be coming from India as well as some still very difficult to explain uh, where these genes uh, came uh, to produce this disease in Sri Lankan uh, populations. And this, uh, out of these 10 patients, it's only, they identify only 15% had this uh, 508 deletions, the classic one we see in uh, Caucasian populations. So uh, that means it is existing, it is present in countries and Asian countries as well. And uh, one of the main important thing is it's missing this disease. It has wide spectrum of clinical presentations. And some of these clinical presentations might attribute to another disease. As Dr. Srimali pointed, it may be uh, managed as tuberculosis or some sort of other infection. So liver disease might be attributed to uh, some other liver diseases. So malabsorptions like that. So uh, that might be one reason. So the, because of this wide spectrum of clinical presentations. As I mentioned earlier, because of this involvement of different mutations, the, uh, the clinical spectrum would be very. So the earliest manifestations, earliest suspicion of this disease comes with meconium ileus because of this very thick uh, 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 inspissated uh, meconium leading to meconium ileus. Importantly, about 15 to 20 percent of children with cystic fibrosis have mucor meconium ileus. In other way, but uh, 80 to 90 percent of children with meconium ileus possibly have cystic fibrosis. Apart from that, uh, meconium intestine, uh, intestine uh, meconium peritonitis, intestinal atresia, a lot of things can happen during the neonatal period. Another thing is prolonged neonatal jaundice. Cystic fibrosis should be considered as one of the differential diagnoses with children, uh, especially the neonates, presenting with prolonged jaundice. And the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So this is one of the important uh, factor leading to the prognosis of these conditions because uh, 85 to 90 percent of all CF cases are pancreatic insufficient, and the pancreatic sufficient proportions are having less disease, less severe disease. But there are some exceptions, obviously. So they show features of malabsorptions, frequent greasy and bulky stools, and they are having obviously a difficulty with bowel movements. So the rest of the thing, next, next most important thing is, is respiratory involvement. So some of the patients, this is the most important factor which decide the outcome of uh, um, children with cystic fibrosis. So obviously, they are coming with recurrent respiratory tract infections and finally leading to bronchiectasis, and they might develop nasal polyposis and later might complicate it with allergy bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So th that is also due to this 
increase thick mucus uh, because the hydration of this mucus will be impaired because of this uh, defective ion transport and this thick mucus is a good uh, culture media for organisms as well as and this activate the infections, inflammations and bronchiectasis cycle and finally lead into significant lung damage in patients with cystic fibrosis if we not identify it early. And failure to thrive, that is one of the other important manifestations. It, it is multifactorial, various uh, causes leading to final this poor weight gain, maybe malabsorptions, poor intake of these patients, increased demand due to some sort of increased respiratory rate and uh, other uh, issues. And uh, there's a metabolic derangement as well. So what is this metabolic derangement? They have pseudobarter syndrome. So it's a hypokalemia, hypochloremia, and metabolic alkalosis, but absence of tubular pathology. The, this is because the sword loss from the, or through the uh, sweat. So uh, uh, one of the earlier clinical manifestations, especially in the West, is this very to uh, salty taste in skin, and what called the salty kiss of some children, leading to the identification of cystic fibrosis, especially in Western countries. And hepatobiliar disease affect the biliary system as well as the liver. Uh, the simple, uh, the earliest form is elevated liver enzymes can have steatosis and finally lead into cirrhosis. Involvement of gall, uh, the better leading to gallstones, and Gut also affecting in the disease, they initially have constipations, a rectal prolapse, and the other important GI manifestation is this distal intestinal obstruction syndrome. This is also functional obstruction. Usually there is no structural obstru obstruction. This is mainly due to inspissated, uh, partially or uh, 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 completely undigested food particles. So this might be initial clinical present, the, the first manifestation or first presentation of these children uh, if it's not being diagnosed with the um, a neonatal screen. So sometimes if it is not diagnosed, these children might end up with surgical procedures, uh, exploratory laparotomies, but actually the management is uh, conservative and most of the time the Enema, maybe gastrocapin or uh, barium enema would relieve the obstructions. And they, some uh, patients, especially with pancreatic sufficient, children might have pancreatitis and rarely they can have fibrosis colonopathy as well. And the endocrine, it's a later manifestations, the cystic fibrosis related diabetes. Uh, this especially shows features of both type and, uh, 1 and type 2 diabetes. And the incidence of this uh, in cystic fibrosis related diabetes is increased with age. And after 30 years, almost 50% of patients with CF have this diabetes. And the other manifestations, the last presentations, if they have didn't have any of these manifestations with a mild disease, sometimes finally they might present uh, with uh, uh, subfertility or infertility when they diagnosis or doing investigations, they uh, might reveal this having obstructive azospermia. The patients, male uh, with cystic fibrosis, 90% of them are infertile, but um, female, 50% of them are fertile. So this is the spectrum of a clinical presentation. There are other minor manifestations as well, but I just focus on the uh, main things. So coming into the principles of management, there are uh, several aspects of things which can we do uh, in the management, which targeting these uh, physiological problems in the children and the patients with cystic fibrosis. Uh, the uh, One of the important thing is airway clearance, as we discussed. So this thick uh, uh, mucus, you can see very thick mucus impacting the uh, airways, it's obstruct the airways. So finally leading to significant lung damage, uh, leading to irreversible bronchiectasis changes. And this finally leading to development of hypoxia, pulmonary hypertension, and end up with co-pulmonale if they uh, um, survive till development of these changes. So clearance of airway. So get rid of this mucus is very important since the beginning of the diagnosis before development of these changes. So there are various methods. I just uh, go through these uh, principles only. Uh, there are methods which the person, the child or patients can do himself without assistance of any person or any devices. One thing is this breathing techniques. There are several breathing techniques. They can induce sputum and get rid of this air. Yeah. And the postural drainage, that is also use of the gravity to drain the uh, sputum uh, uh, to if there are uh, significant collections in local areas 
and then the dependent so the dependent means the therapy therapist may uh, uh, need or this devices so the percussion that's the classic one we are using uh, for this any respiratory diseases in centuries you know about this thing and the uh, um, devices so there are a lot of devices there are uh, this is some principles especially these oscillating pep devices the oscillating positive expiratory pressure devices these devices there are a lot of uh, few uh, different kinds of this but the principle is same there is something vibrating so this acapella device you some of you are familiar with this containing the magnetic ball with vibrate as well as uh, it produce some sort of a positive expiratory pressure during expiration so both these produce uh, some sort of increase the lung volume increase collateral ventilations as well as uh, uh, giving some oscillatory waves which improve the, the breakdown of this uh, mucus plugs which facilitate the final uh, clearance of this mucus plugs and there are the devices which uh, like this high frequency chest wall oscillations they called the vest device which can wrap around the chest and it's connected to machines which give rise uh, induce a high frequency oscillation so the same thing that uh, mimicking the our uh, uh, percussion techniques which done by the peace therapist and uh, so uh, this, as we don't have uh, most of these uh, sophisticated thing the same principles can be applied with using this bottle pep device a simple bottle with uh, water or uh, soap water or just water 10 cm so the 10 cm is the uh, pep the positive expiratory pressure 10 cm water is the pressure and while uh, blowing it through it produce bubbles this bubbling uh, produce some sort of uh, oscillatory waves so it's almost equal to these sophisticated devices so we are also using in this device in our setup because the lack of these uh, devices oscillating pep devices it works and there are some adjuncts apart from these devices uh, some other things are the drugs the bronchodilators it's if there is in reversible compound it dilate the bronchi and facilitate the airway clearance and there are mucolytic agents like hypertonic saline in our setup uh, we are using three percent but other countries they use seven percent or eight percent saline again same thing to absorb more and more water into the lumen and increase the hydrations and uh, reduce the thickness of this uh, mucus facilitating the drainage and dry powder manitol the same the uh, uh, same mechanisms osmotically uh, drag more water into the lumen and the dnas it's break down the dns because this mucus contain a lot of cells inflammatory cells and the break down this uh, nuclei of these inflammatory cells that is also facilitate the breakdown of mucus like donor alpha and uh, nsaid cysteine also had been used but it's now not being used in other countries because its efficacy is uh, significantly low and the next uh, uh, type of management is pancreatic enzyme supplementations uh, as you know dr thilly will discuss a little bit about this uh, so this is very important if the child is having pancreatic enzyme uh, insufficient see so no point of giving foods without giving the supplements uh, so otherwise uh, uh, just they uh, go through the bubble and then uh, might not absorb anything so it's e the giving food it is equally important to giving food as well as giving enzyme supplementation sometimes our setup there are practical issues sometimes these uh, um, capsules are not available and there are practical issues giving into small baby especially infants who are breastfeeding on uh, milk but still if we give it in a proper way we can see dramatic results and the growth and nutrition is very important i am not going to details obviously so any disease any chronic disease growth and nutrition is important but cystic fibrosis especially having this uh, nutritional issues malabsorption and other problems respiratory tract infections increased demand all these things lead into significant growth retardation so it's very important to provide adequate nutrition and some countries they using even uh, gastrostomy uh, gastrostomies and giving overnight feeds with low threshold if the uh, growth is not that much uh, the or it's not going with the adequate standards because the lung growth and other growth so all these is important to get rid of this otherwise if the child is already have nutritional issues the growth is retarded then the outcome would be very 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 poor 
and then the uh, respiratory infection so as i uh, mentioned earlier so the infections can lead into inflammations and these inflammations uh, uh, produce some sort of lung damage and lead into bronchiectasis and again bronchiectasis lead into infections and though this vicious cycle going on and finally lead into significant lung damage in patients with this so because of that it's very important to identify these organisms early and uh, prevention of these infections uh, and uh, vigorously treating these infections. So uh, as you know, it's uh, this cystic fibrosis, it's uh, associated with specific type of organisms, especially uh, the uh, colonizers in the lungs. Actually, they are not, even though we as colonizers, they are pathogens. Uh, that's why even the child doesn't have uh, some sign of time Sometimes child might not show any clinical evidence of acute infections. All the inflammatory markers would be normal. Lungs would be perfectly clear. But still, still, if these organisms is there, for example, like pseudomonas, give rise to subclinical inflammatory process and finally end up with acute infection. So because of that, we have to pay uh, maximum attention as much as possible. We have to eradicate these uh, organisms and especially other countries, they use this long-term nebulized antibiotics like uh, tobramycin, cholestin, astronam, alternatively, every monthly. And other thing is, uh, so later in their life, they develop uh, the, uh, organisms or gets infected with non-tuberculous mycobacteria and some Burkholia species. For example, if the Burkholia is identified in the respiratory tract of patients with cystic fibrosis, they treat with IV antibiotics as well as nebulize uh, meropenem for 18 months minimally. So that is that type of aggressive treatment is going on. So Dr. Thilney will discuss a little bit more about these organisms which are particular to cystic fibrosis and the immune modulators. So all this management done in cystic fibrosis up to the last decade targeted the um, uh, some sort of uh, conservative type management. It didn't target the org, um, uh, uh, the uh, actual disease. The one thing is this immune modulator, uh, just uh, like this, uh, we are using this macrolide and acetromyces, produce some sort of uh, uh, modulator. This, these are not uh, immune suppressants. It just uh, prevent or just uh, reduce this excessive inflammatory response that uh, might, re that means it's delay the progression of disease, especially the development of bronchiectasis. Uh, especially our setup, we are using this acetromycin. There are various mechanisms to explain how these uh, macroids act. And we have to monitor uh, these patients. There are a lot of things we have to monitor. Uh, this only the few things I just mentioned. Obviously, as I mentioned, we have to monitor the growth, lung function. This is also very important. Sometimes the child might do very perfectly uh, without any problems clinically, but the FEV1 might be reduced. That means this problem is going on subclinical insights. So in other countries, they electively do bronchoscopies to identify the possible cause or whether these organisms is going on. And if the FEV1 is normal, then they do um, lung clearance index. And if it uh, requires chest and microbiology colonizers, obviously we have to identify, do corpse of so, uh, sputum cultures to get the organisms, catch the organisms, echocardiography, liver scans, blood sugar, especially uh, later part of the life after 10 years of age, ABPS screening and the monitoring of puberty and all these things. So it's a um, holistic care of these children, which is um, uh, because they're having multiple organ involvement and multiple issues. And the finally, the specific treatment for cystic fibrosis. So the, the earlier, all these, all these measures, we just uh, uh, try to uh, support some sort of uh, uh, management, but didn't attempt to reverse the primary problem, which is a channel defects. So now for the last... Uh, uh, decades, especially last two decades and last decades is practically uh, now using this uh, specific target. This is one of the major breakthrough in the management of cystic fibrosis. So it's try to attempt or this reverse the primary abnormalities. There are three classes of drugs, new drugs, and this has revolutionized the management of cystic fibrosis and many, many researchers are now going on this area and a lot of pharmaceutical companies investing billions in this area to find out the drugs which correct this primary abnormality. There are three types of drugs. The potentiators are the uh, improving the gating. That's the target, the file, the type two, four, three and four uh, defects. Mainly the channel is there, but the function is not proper. So it's uh, potentiate the effect of this channel. And the correctors, especially the type two disease, 
try to correct the uh, the the defect, especially the form the the defective formation of the channel. And now the amplifier also it's increased the amount of CFTR proteins. And there are combinations uh, like uh, Okambi. This is the first uh, drug came to the market, but these drugs are very, very, very expensive. For example, uh, to give Okambi for a patient, it, it, it costs about 40 lakhs per month in Sri Lankan rupees. So it's not available in uh, patients in even other countries in a pre -lease. So still they are using as trials or some sympathetic ground. So finally, so if we discussed the cystic fibrosis and diagnosis and management in Asia. So we don't have newborn screening in any country. Uh, that might not be uh, a, a, a cost effective anyway, because it's low number. So because of that, we have to wait till they, they become symptomatic. And even they uh, present with symptomatic, uh, we might not be able to identify these early stages. And most of the time, uh, we, when we diagnose these conditions, they have the advanced disease. And uh, because one thing is lack of awareness of the disease and sometimes some uh, places might not have the, the confirmatory test available and still we don't have proper registers or, or in the ACI as well. And lack of devices and drugs, especially we don't have this sophisticated drug as well as the devices. And all these things lead into very limited life expectancy in this region. And, and because of that, cystic fibrosis is still a pediatric disease in these regions. We don't have adults surviving to adulthood uh, because of this significant reduced life expectancy in these children. So in summary, so cystic fibrosis is existing in non-Caucasian people as well. It is present in Asia. It has been recognized, reported, and uh, management is doing in Sri Lanka as well. So if we are more aware of the disease, we can identify more patients. So for that, high degree of suspicion is important. So early interventions, early diagnosis and interventions is the key to improve the quality of life of these patients and especially the life expectancy and need to uh, make CF as an adult disease in Asia too. So finally, this is a growth chart of a child who had meconium, uh, meconium ileus. Because of this meconium ileus, uh, we suspected uh, possible cystic fibrosis, but uh, that time couldn't arrange the uh, sweat chloride test, but still started on uh, pancreatic enzyme supplementation therapy. So you can see. So there is a dramatic improvement in this child's growth following identifications and finally the genetic testing also done and confirmed the case of cystic fibrosis. So you can clearly see this dramatic improvement in weight after starting pancreatic enzyme supplementations and giving it very correctly. So miracles can happen. So miracles do happen uh, if we have the awareness or suspect and if we address it as early as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam, and good afternoon, all. Uh, to recap uh, and strengthen our knowledge on cystic fibrosis, let's move uh, to MCQ quiz on cystic fibrosis. So I'll be discussing here five MCQs. So the MCQ one. Uh, you all can read, uh, um, you, you all can guess the answers while I'm reading the stem so that we don't have to uh, exp uh, spend extra time at the end. Uh, which of the fol uh, following are true or false regarding the diagnostic criteria of cystic fibrosis? Uh, first stem, a history of cystic fibrosis in a sibling. Second stem, a positive newborn screening test. Third one, two elevated sweat chloride concentrations. Fourth stem, identification of a single CF mutations. Final stem, an abnormal nasal potential difference measurement. Yes, this is an uh, easy question. So uh, let's move uh, to the answers. 
prostem, a history of cystic fibrosis in a sibling. Uh, that is true. So I'll be discussing, I'll be telling whether these answers are true or false first, and then, then I'll be discussing around the key topic of the MCQ later. So the second one, a positive newborn screening test, that is uh, again true. Third one, two elevated sweat chloride concentrations. That stem is again true. And identification of a single CF mutations. So that is false. Uh, we have to identify uh, at least two mutations uh, to fulfill the diagnostic, diagnostic criteria. And the final stem, an abnormal nasal potential difference, uh, difference measurement. That stem is again true. So about the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis requires a combination of clinical features suggestive of the disease with biochemical or genetic markers of cystic fibrosis, transmembrane, conductance, regulator gene dysfunction. So newborn screening that is available in the West allows early detection. And in newborn screening, as we heard earlier, immunoreactive trypsinogen, IRT, is measured on a dried blood spot obtained on a Guthrie card at day six of life. So I have listed here the common diagnostic test uh, that we are using that can be used in cystic fibrosis. The commonest would be the sweat test. I'll be discussing about the sweat test in detail in my uh, later slides and the genetic testing. So there are about uh, closer to 2000 mutations that uh, in CFTR gene uh, causing cystic fibrosis. We can identify uh, most of uh, these genes uh, by doing uh, genetic test and nasal uh, potential difference. Again, I'll be discuss about this topic uh, while I'm proceeding and pancreatic function assessment by stool pancreatic elastase one activity and uh, obviously the radiological investigations by uh, means of chest X-ray and HRCT of the chest. Uh, there we can demonstrate bilateral central bronchiectasis, mucus infection with segmental collapse, air trapping, and there's delayed uh, pneumatization of the O mucosal thickening in sinuses. And uh, of course, pulmonary function test also useful in the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis they usually show obstructive pattern. And microbiological studies, especially the isolation of pseudomonas and work called area are uh, suggestive of cystic fibrosis disease. So here you can see HRCT imaging of the um, lung of a CF patient where uh, it is having a signet, cell, uh, signet ring sign suggestive of bronchiectasis, so we can appreciate central bronchiectasis here. Here's the diagrammatic representation of a nasal potential difference measurement uh, due to the uh, chloride canal abnormality. I'll be discussing about this later. And uh, diagnostic criteria of cystic fibrosis, uh, which uh, have formulated by Cystic Fibrosis Foundation consensus report uh, uh, in 2017, they are one or more characteristic clinical features or a positive newborn screening test result or a history of cystic fibrosis in a sibling plus increased sweat chloride concentration by pilocarpine antiporosis method on two or more occasions or identification of two CF causing mutations or demonstration of abnormal nasal epithelial ion transport. Uh, about uh, transnatal, uh, trans epithelial potential difference, uh, that is a labor intensive and technically difficult method available only at uh, few CF research centers at West. The finding of increased potential differences across nasal, nasal epithelium, uh, that is the increased voltage response to tropical amyloride application followed by the absence of voltage response to a beta adrenergic agonist. It is, a, it is a difficult uh, test to do in small children as it requires cooperation, but may be a useful uh, test in older indeterminate cases. It can be done easily on young children uh, while under general anesthesia. Yes, then let's move to the MCQ number two. Uh, regarding the uh, aquatic wrinkling 
uh, aquatic farmer inclin test in cystic fibrosis uh, and it is an ancillary test to suggest cystic fibrosis it cannot be used in children if the test is positive sweat test is not necessary for the diagnosis aquatic farmer inclin is seen in cf carriers time to wrinkling decreases with the decrease CFTR protein function. So let's move to the answers. For the first term, it is an ancillary test to suggest cystic fibrosis. Yes, that is true. And the second one, it cannot be used in children. That can be used in children even. So the stem is false. Uh, if the test is positive, sweat test is not necessary for the diagnosis. That is false. And fourth stream, aquatic farmer inclin is seen in CF carriers. Yes, that is true. And the final stream is again true. Time to wrinkling decreases with the decreased CFTR protein function. Yes. Uh, what is this aquatic farmer inclin test? Aquatic wrinkling of the farms was first reported in 1974 by Elliot uh, in a letter to director in Lancet describing an anecdotal observation in children with cystic fibrosis suggesting that three minutes and a bowl of water might provide a cheap screening test for CF. Uh, this refers to white uh, edematous farmer plaques rapidly appearing shortly after water exposure, especially with hot water. Histologically, hyperkeratosis, dilated eccrine ostea, and aberrant aquaporin 5 expression are characteristic, but the pathogenesis of it remains unknown. Wrinkling of the farms, as you all know, is a physiological response to prolonged water immersion occurring an average of 11.5 minutes after uh, water exposure. So there are so many uh, research uh, articles about aquatic wrinkling of skin, but I have depicted here these articles published in uh, India by a group of experts, team led by Prof. Sushil Kabra from All India Institute of Medicine. They, they are report, uh, they conclude that in places with uh, no facility for set test, children with phenotype compatible with cystic fibrosis who develop aquatic wrinkling in three minutes may be diagnosed as probable CF and referred for confirmation by sweat test. So this is the appearance of aquatic uh, wrinkling of water, and this is the histology with hyperkeratosis and dilated eccrine sweat gland ostea. So aquatic palmer wrinkling is a simpler ancillary test to aid the diagnosis of cystic fibrosis. Hyperinkling occurring within three minutes of exposure to water. It is associated with cystic fibrosis and has been reported in a CF carrier too. It is seen uh, in as many as 80% of people with the disease, including children. It suggests that time to take uh, wrinkling decreases with the decrease CFTR protein function. So carriers, it takes longer time in the CF disease. Uh, in short time, wrinkling appears. So uh, the third MCQ, uh, that is about uh, sweat test. Uh, it is diagnostic of cystic fibrosis. Pilocarpin locally stimulate the sweat glands. And the third stem, sweat chloride concentration of less than 30 is considered normal. Addison's disease can cause false positive sweat test. And the final one, sweat test is recommended to be done in day one of life. Yes, let's move to the answers. First one, it is diagnostic of cystic fibrosis. It helps in the diagnostic, but it is a, screen, it is a screening test. So that is not diagnostic of bronchiectasis, um, cystic fibrosis. Uh, Pilocarpy locally stimulate the sweat glands. Yes, that is true. Sweat chloride concentration less than 30 millimoles is considered normal. That is again true. Addison's disease can cause false positive sweat test. That is true. Final list, uh, stem is false. Sweat test is recommended to be done in day one in life. That is false. We can't do sweat test in 
first day of life. So about sweat test. Sweat test which involves uh, using pilocarpine antiporosis to collect sweat and performing chemical analysis of its chloride content is the standard approach to diagnose cystic fibrosis. An electric current is used to carry pilocarpine into, into the skin of the forearm and locally stimulate sweat glands. After sweat is collected, the specimens are analyzed for its chloride concentration. This is how the test is being done. Uh, at TLRH, this, this test is available. Pilocarpine uh, is used to stimulate sweat gland and the collector's sweat is analyzed for its chloride concentration. Testing may be difficult in first two weeks of life because a low sweat rates, but it uh, but uh, it's recommended at any time after first 48 hours of life. Positive test results should be confirmed and for a negative result, the test should be repeated if suspicion of the diagnosis remains. Sweat test can reliably make the diagnosis in 98% of patients of cystic fibrosis. Despite the availability of genotyping, uh, the majority of children in whom cystic fibrosis needs to be excluded usually first undergo sweat testing, mainly due to financial and uh, test availability concerns. So the interpretation, uh, sweat chloride con concentration less than 30 millimoles per liter would be normal and 30 to 60 is considered at bo as borderline and cystic fibrosis is confirmed if sweat chloride concentration is uh, more than 60 millimoles per liter. As uh, with uh, any other screening test, sweat test also can have false negative and false positive test results. So false positive test results can be uh, seen with malnutrition, skin disorders such as severe eczema, dermatitis, adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism, and autonomic dysfunction. Transit increases in sweat chloride can be seen in young patients with immunodeficiency states. False negative test results can be seen with skin edema and hyponatremia, but usually the most common case of incorrect sweat chloride test is a lab bearer. Yes, the, then the MCQ number four. This is about pulmonary pathogens in cystic fibrosis. First one, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the commonest pathogen in early life. Pseudomonas aeruginosa was the uh, most important risk factor for the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary deterioration. Burkholderia capacia is an uncommon pathogen. Bacterial load in the airways determine the degree of airway damage. And the final one, epidemiology of bacterial pathogens in CF, CF patients has become more simple. This is again an ECMCQ. Let's move to the answers. Pseudomonas aerogenosa is the commonest pathogen in early life. So pseudomonas is a common pathogen, but not in early life, usually. Pseudomonas aerogenosa uh, is an important risk factor for, uh, for pulmonary uh, deterioration. That is true. Burkhold area is a common pathogen in cystic fibrosis. So this term is false. And bacterial load in the airways determine the degree of airway damage. That's it. That is true. And epidemiology of bacterial pathogens in CF patients has become more simple. That is false. That is becoming more complex nowadays. So about pulmonary pathogens in cystic fibrosis, finding of Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa on culture of low airway, low airway strongly suggests a diagnosis of CF. In particular, mucoid forms of C uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa are often recovered from CF lungs. Presence of mucoid uh, Pseudomonas was the most important risk factor for pulmonary deterioration. During the first decade of life of CF patients, Staph aureus and Haemophilus influenzae are the most common bacteria isolated from the sputum, but in second to third decade, Pseudomonas is the most prevalent bacteria. So this diagram depicts that in early life, Haemophilus and the step is the commonest uh, pathogens. And then 
uh, in la uh, later life in second and third decay pseudomonas predominates then burkholder area uh, it remains as uh, low grade pathogens across the life span of a cf patient burkholder area uh, recovery also suggests cystic fibrosis as we described earlier a wide range of other organisms are frequently recovered particularly in advanced lung disease they include variety of gram negative rods including stonotropomonas and uh, acromobacter fungi and non tb mycobacteria failure of respiratory symptom flares to respond to usual antibiotics triggers testing for mycoplasma and viruses and bacteria density of the airways correlate with the degree of airway inflammation and infection Although the epidemiology of bacterial pathogens in CF patients has become more complex, the life expectancy of these patients continues to increase with the advancement of the treatment and diagnostic strategies. So this necessitates necessitate the better control of transmission of these pathogens. Gentamicin and dobramycin are recognized as standard antibiotics for the treatment of CF patients infected with pseudomonas. and steroids are also useful in the treatment is of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis abpa and severe reactive airway disease occasionally encountered in children with cystic fibrosis as as a complication of it so the final mcq about the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy so stems are first one uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy pert contains lipase protease and amylase and treatment success is monitored with the weight gain measurement and the third one pancreatic supplements should be should not be given to babies on exclusive breastfeeding and pancreatic enzyme supplements uh, are ph sensitive and most effective when given with acidic media and the final stem administration of excessive doses can cause colonic strictures Okay, let's move uh, to the answers. Pert contains lipase, protease, protease, and amylase. Yes, that is true. It contains all the digestive enzymes. Uh, uh, treatment success is monitored with the weight gain measurement. That is true. Pancreatic enzyme supplements should not be given to babies on exclusive breastfeeding. That is false. We can give even in the exclusive breastfeeding period. Uh, but I feel sensitive and most effective when given with acidic media. That is true. And administration of excessive doses can cause colonic structures. Yes, that is a well-known side effects of PERT, excessive doses of PERT. So about pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, it contains three digestive enzymes: lipase, protease, and amylase. Pancreatic exocrine replacement therapy given with ingested uh, food reduces but not fully correct the stool fat and nitrogen losses. Weight gain monitors the treatment success. Enzyme dosage and product should be individualized for each patient. Enteric coated pH sensitive microspheres are most often prescribed. So these are uh, pancreatic enzyme uh, PERT capsules and they contain enzyme containing microspheres these granules so the granules are best given with acidic semi solid media like yogurt or jam and can be given with breast milk too enzymes can be taken at the beginning during or at the end of the meal enzymes are most effective for 20 to 30 minutes once taken so ideally meal should be finished within this time abdominal symptoms st uh, stool ca characteristics such as oily floating pale stools loose stools are indicators that pert is not optimal and administration of excessive doses has been linked to colonic strictures that will conclude the mcq uh, quiz about cystic fibrosis thank you for your attention thank you
The next question is um, actually there are a few cases of adult patients with cystic fibrosis in Sri Lanka, uh, also doctor cases. It was reported in the case series shown PMC medical genetics. What is your opinion on doing selective screening of? CSF with stress test in young patients with cystic fibrosis because Sri Lankan mutation spectrum is different and we have some less severe mutation that lead to presentation in adulthood. So what is your opinion on doing selective screening of CSF with stress test in young patients with bronchial cases? Yeah. Um... Yes, uh, there are few patients, even this uh, series, there was uh, 20 year old, 22 year old patients identified. So, there are very few cases, especially with very mild disease. But the problem is, if children have the real acid disease, they are not surviving up to the adulthood. Uh, so, because of that, that is actually uh, patients with uh, coming with evidence of bronchial cases, even though they don't have uh, evidence of pancreatic enzyme uh, deficiencies. Uh, we do this uh, sector I test, so we are like to mention uh, Dr. Desha Jarsing and the chemical pathologist of LRH who is doing the, who is pioneer in the uh, making this uh, sector I test is available. She's doing uh, this since early uh, 2020s. Uh, so, uh, the support from the chemical pathologist that has been initially like practicing. So, if there is a clinical suspicion, yes, uh, but they select these patients because it's uh, uh, expensive one is sometimes these reagents are not available freely, so because of that, still we have some sort of restrictions because of that, still we scrutinize these patients and do these tests for uh, especially most necessary children. But yes, it still is worthwhile to uh, do a uh, sectoral test uh, patients with cystic uh, established bronchial cases, even though uh, they don't show evidence of other manifestations of CF like uh, pancreatic enzyme uh, deficiencies. Thank you very much. Have you tried lung transplants? Yes, ma'am. Other countries they are doing lung transplantation, so there are several uh, indications. So, cystic fibrosis, simple indication is that PV1 is less than 30%. That's the indication of lung transplantation. But some patients uh, later develop significant bronchial cases and hypoxia, and some patients later develop. Uh, because of the bronchial cases, apparent vessel formation and hemoptysis. Uh, so these are the early candidates of doing lung transplantation. But even in UK, pediatric lung transplantation are in two centers. Uh, so that is also uh, very limited availability. And some patients even get indicated, like there are some contraindications, like some infections, like Bertolia, Senosepatia, it's a little contraindications because that is a very, very nasty organism. So even the uh, transplanted lung might affect the same as this uh, mycobacterium species like that. Uh, so there are uh, still, even in uh, UK, still not being done in uh, very frequent cases, but yes, uh, uh, it is indicated CF and it being done. Any other question? Yeah, questions from the audience? So, um, in the absence of any other questions, on behalf of the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, let me um, uh, communicate my uh, sincere gratitude to the team of pediatricians who uh, contributed for this uh, clinical meeting to make it a great success. It was a great success because the participation was almost about 150. Uh, so let me show our appreciation from the Sri Lanka Medical uh, Association uh, uh, by presenting them with the documentation of their presentation at this clinical meeting. Uh, Dr. Srimali Vijay Sundara.
So uh, again, let me thank uh, all of them for this most interesting sort of an eye-opener of a rare condition that has been in existence among us for years, but needs uh, identification and long-term management. Thank you very much uh, for you, uh, for being present here, as well as thank you very much for all uh, who have joined us online. Thank you very much.